your Bibles, if you would join me in the book of 1 John, 1 John chapter 1. We look our, and give our attention to uh, uh, a powerful book, and I say powerful because like most letters in the New Testament that begin with some sort of kind greeting or a warm welcome, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John don't do that, that John has a message to proclaim, like other New Testament authors, but this time it's different. This time it's to believers that really knew deep down what was right, uh, but were battling with a struggle. And I guess you could argue that most every other letter Paul writes is about the same, that he's writing to churches, to brothers and sisters that are battling with some struggle. But at least in this time, there was a moment in their faith where John wanted them to be sure, that it was a struggle. Maybe it's a struggle that all of us relate to at some point or, or another, whether we're sure about what we believe, that maybe a mark of spiritual maturity is deciding what we've been thinking all of our lives or maybe what we had heard, what's really true, what does God really want us to know. And this book is a powerful reminder of the things that we can be 100% sure of, that John writes, 1 John 5 and verse 13, as Joey mentioned, so that they could be sure, that they could know some 40 times in this short book of 1 John, does John mention the word K-N-O-W, know, to know, to be sure, to know without a doubt, with full confidence and complete assurance that Jesus Christ is, in fact, the risen, resurrected Lord and the one who died to save us from our sins. And it's that idea this morning that we focus our attention around the book of 1 John. And we chose to construct our uh, worship this way that we would focus on those two facts, the fact that Jesus was in fact risen from the dead, that there were eyewitnesses that saw and testified to the fact that Jesus did fulfill Scripture and all prophecy as he was killed and risen from the dead. But not just that. It's not just enough to believe and acknowledge that, but then to see why it happened and the purpose for which all of those things took place and how it means something to us in this place as we channel our thoughts toward the Lord's Supper this morning and we share in that time remembering those very things. It was a perfect segue, a perfect buildup to channel our thoughts toward that end. Most likely, the book of 1 John was written to Ephesus, or at least in the region of Ephesus. And we know that because when we look at the Apostle John, the one who wrote the Gospel account of John, and the one who wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, much of his ministry, his leadership, and his apostleship was done in or around Ephesus. And what we know about Ephesus is that it was a center for Greek culture. That is, that there were a lot of people that would come together in the region of Ephesus. It was a melting pot of all kinds of cultures. It was a melting pot of all kinds of religions. And so you can imagine that there were various opinions, various schools of thought, various ideologies that would all come together and would surely make someone who was trying to figure out what they believed just a little bit confused because you had all of these different perspectives and opinions, much like what we deal with today. So many people have an idea that it's really hard to decide what is true and what isn't. And Ephesus was no different. And so you have this idea of all of these ideas and all of these religious thoughts being in one place. But not to mention when Paul was visiting with the eldership at the church at Ephesus in Acts 20 in verse 29, Paul told them that there would be men that would come in like ravenous wolves or like fierce wolves wolves that would come in and basically rip the church at Ephesus apart by their false teaching and their false gospels. And that obviously became true because when John writes in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, he's addressing two major situations. The first major situation that you see, a lot of terms suggest that there must have been relational issues in the church at Ephesus. That is the way brothers and sisters were relating to each other because much of the book is spent talking about love and how your relationships build with each other and with God. The second major issue that John is dealing with is the confidence they had in what they believed. Could what they had been given in Jesus Christ and the ministry that he lived and led, is that the truth? Is that something that they can be confident of and be sure of? And obviously someone at some point had come along and convinced these Christians, perhaps in the church at Ephesus or maybe in the greater region of such, that they weren't really 
really sure in what they believed, that they weren't confident in Jesus Christ. And so when John writes to these people, you have to understand that these Christians are hurt and they're torn and they're trying to decide, is what I have in my hands really what I need to believe? There's a lot at stake here because what good is Christianity or why would I pursue Christianity if what I'm believing isn't actually true? Why would I pursue it if it's not actually going to amount anything? Is what I'm doing with my life, the choice that I've made to be a Christian, isn't going to amount to anything? Is it going to amount to anything? John writes in such a way that gets to the heart of the believers. These aren't believers that need teaching. They need encouraging. They need strengthening. They need building up in their faith so that they can be confident. And I hope that's our aim this morning, that we could be confident in knowing what we know about Jesus. The first section of scripture I want us to focus our attention on as far as getting this Christianity thing right is concerned. What advice did John give to these Christians who needed to be built up to be sure of their salvation? And I like the way that he starts in 1 John 1, 1 through 4. Clay read it for us just a few moments ago, so I won't reread it word for word, but I want you to think about the focus that John puts in the minds of these Christians initially. It's almost like John says, this Jesus that we're proclaiming to you is the real Jesus, the real in the flesh, in the body. You can put your hands on him. Listen to what he said, Jesus. Essentially, John presents to them this idea of Christianity is not something that's rooted in a myth or a fable or a story. It's not something that anyone just dreamed up at any time. It is rooted in the dirt and dust of history. It's rooted in the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ himself. And the language that John uses to prove that, as Clay read, that John literally says, I saw him and I heard him, and I laid my hands on him, and I was in the same room as him. I saw all the things that he said and all of the things he did. That alone would be enough for most people, especially maybe the Christians that are in the region of Ephesus as they recognize John's apostolic authority, and they saw that he had experienced the things that he had, and they obviously recognized him as a teacher, but even more than that, he was an elder, and so they obviously respected him. But if he says, I saw Jesus with my own eyes, eyes and I heard him with my own ears and I touched him with my own hands and I was there to see everything Jesus did. Well, that was enough in the minds of those people to help them think, okay, maybe John is being serious. Maybe there's something really real about this idea. Now, the fact of the matter is everything rises and falls right here. Because if the, if the Christians that are reading John's letter don't get the fact that it's rooted in a real event, that Jesus Christ literally walked this earth and ministered to people and did die and was resurrected from the grave, if they didn't get that, then nothing else mattered. That, that if that wasn't something that was sealed in their minds, then nothing else that John said from any point forward was going to mean anything. Everything he says rises and falls right here. That this is rooted in a real person of Jesus Christ. I heard a man say one time, Ty, it really doesn't matter if the Bible stories are real anyway. Like, it doesn't matter if they're real. It doesn't matter if you believe if they're real. Just as long as you take the lessons that God intended you to take from the stories, then you've accomplished what the Bible is intended. And John doesn't let people get away with that. He doesn't let them say that, that the Bible is real and Jesus is real. It's not just, it doesn't matter if he's real or not. It matters if you just get the good lessons the Bible teaches. And John says, no, that's not how this works. Jesus is real. And because he's real and because he stands the test of time and because he proves all of these prophecies to be true and right, even down to the letter, you have something worth believing. That's what he says in John 1, 1 through 4. And not just to mention what John mentions in his declaration to these Christians, but then you think about all of the other evidence that's suggested to prove that Jesus does exist. Not just do secular historians talk about it all the time, about the life and the proof that Jesus gave and left so that we know for sure he lived. But I thought about 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 6, where Paul mentions, I guess in verses 1 through 4, about the gospel that he had declared to the church at Corinth, what, that they received, that they stood on. It was their foundation. It was firm. That's the gospel, that Jesus died according to the scriptures, was buried according to the scriptures, rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. Verse 5, that he appeared to Cephas or Peter, and then the 12, and then verse 6, 1 Corinthians 15 
15 and verse 6, that 500 other witnesses saw the resurrected Jesus Christ. It would be enough if it were Peter and the disciples that saw him, but then 500 more. So at least 512 people saw Jesus. More than that did, but at least 512 did. And we know take to the bank, that what John is preaching to these people, it's rooted in the real life of Jesus Christ. That the eyewitness testimony that you and I have, that we base our faith on, on this very moment, right here in this place, that the eyewitness testimony is compelling. And I know this, that the language that John uses in 1 John 1 through 1, 1 through 4, is very similar to what he uses to open up his gospel account in John chapter 1, where he talks about the Word being with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, John 1, 1 through 4, and verse 14, very similar to what you read in John 1, 1 John 1, I'll get a lot of ones right here, 1 John 1, 1 through 4. Language is very similar. Same writer, same Jesus, same message. He dwelt with God, left his dwelling to live with us, to tabernacle with us, to make a temporary home with us, to live and lead and teach us toward heaven. That's what he came to do. And he died and he ascended and he went back to heaven right at the right hand of God and he lives to make intercession for us. John preaches that message by the life of the message of Jesus Christ. And it's that Jesus that we proclaim this morning. And as we venture closer to that great moment where we get to share with our Lord, let us know and believe. And not just here this morning, but as we go and we live and we interact with people, that, that it's not just something fake. You know, it's not just a fable or a myth that people dream up. It's not some just fun story that we're telling to get us through to heaven, that it's real, that Jesus Christ is real real and he's alive and he means something to John and he meant something to us and that every road to eternity, every road to eternity runs right through Jesus, the real Jesus. John 14 and verse 6, John says, or John records Jesus saying, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Acts 4 and verse 12, Luke says, there's no other name under heaven whereby men must be saved than that of Jesus Christ. What we believe this morning is rooted in the real thing. Not fake, not fable, not myth, but the real person of Jesus Christ. And that fuels us to worship him with all we have. <clears throat> I know that my Redeemer lives and ever prays for me. I know eternal life he gives from sin and sorrow free i know i know that my redeemer lives i know i know eternal life he gives i know i know that my redeemer lives i know to sin for his saving grace is nigh. I know that he will come again to take me home on high. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know, I know eternal life he gives. I know stands a place prepared for me a home a house not made with hands most wonderful to see i know i know that my redeemer is i know i know eternal life he gives i know Be seated, please. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. 
For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. As you continue in 1 John and you make it past the declaration that he makes in the first four verses about the reality of Jesus, which is important, right? It's not enough, though, to just believe that Jesus exists. All of us acknowledge that this morning. Perhaps the whole world, even secular history, says Jesus was real. That's really a fact that the world understands. But I guess what separates those who are really true and I guess care deeply about Jesus, something that they would make it a reality in their life too, that it's not just enough to believe he exists, but then that he makes a change in their life, that it actually amounted to something more than just saying Jesus believes. And so what John does in 1 John 1 and verse 5 is make a statement, a statement that becomes a message and a common theme throughout the rest of the book. It's a contrast really between what is true about us and true about God. And the and the message was this. This is the message, verse 5, that we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light, and in him there is absolutely no darkness. And we read that and we think, okay, well, what does that mean, right? In him is no darkness, God is a light. And I think it stands for us to consider for just a second maybe the metaphor of light and what light does, how light reflects uh, or light dispels darkness, I guess would probably be the most easy definition, but that it sustains, it nurtures, it allows people or things to grow. But maybe the most notable one, and perhaps the one that John draws on more than any, is the fact that it does dispel darkness. Or maybe you could even say that it stands in direct opposition to darkness, that those two things can't coexist, that light and darkness don't exist together perfectly or in a beneficial way, that light will always overpower the darkness. And in a sense, when we read the book of 1 John and maybe even the scripture as a whole, we see that image very clearly about God, right? That God not just nurtures and sustains us, that he gives us the life that we need to live both physically and eternally or spiritually, but that God dispels the darkness and that those two things can't coexist. That God and something that pledges allegiance to the darkness or something that lives in the darkness, those two things can't be in a relationship with each other. It just doesn't work. And so what we realize is that when we read 1 John 1 and verse 5, that we have a huge problem because as John begins to unfold or peel back the layers of what is the darkness, it becomes evidently clear that he's describing the reality of brothers and sisters in Christ who were struggling with their sin and their identity as a Christian, that they were having this trouble of deciding whether or not they were going to wholeheartedly commit to Jesus because they couldn't really be sure if what he was was saying was right and true, which is why John is writing, or if they were just going to live after the darkness, or if they were just going to live after the world. And so what it does for us as readers is challenge us to make this, this understanding or have this understanding. What does it mean then that God can't coexist with darkness because God is light? What does that look like in my life? And then you read this in verse 6. If we say we have fellowship with him, and yet we walk in the darkness. We are lying and do not practice the truth. Verse 8 now. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Verse 10. If we say we have sinned, or rather we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Verses uh, 6 8 and 10 present a problem. The problem is that we have an issue or a tendency to live in the darkness, that we naturally, I guess, are pushed or progress toward darkness. It's a conscious decision to walk in the light or be near the light. And so we have this question that's presented then naturally. How do we deal with the problem of darkness? What's the answer to darkness? That John gives. There are two wrong answers in this chapter, and there are one, there is one right answer. Let's consider the wrong answers for a second. As far as our problem of sin and living in the darkness, there are two ways to respond to the question: how do I deal with the problem? 
John says the first way that we respond in the wrong when we're answering the question, how do I deal with my sin problem, is to number one, think that sin doesn't matter. That's what verse 6 says, that there are some people that were saying, we have fellowship with God, but we also live in the darkness. That's a problem, okay? That those two things can't coexist. Remember that. Light and darkness can't be in a relationship together. And so you had these people that said, I want to be a Christian. I am a Christian. I love God. I'm proud to be his child. And I'll live that way, perhaps while they're at church or with their people or whatever it is. Maybe when it's easy that they're a Christian, but then the second that they leave that place or they leave those people or they just uh, lose a sense of their identity, they live in the world. And they live there. That's not just something they visit from time to time, but that's where their allegiance lies. They love the world. First John 2, he talks about that. That you can't love the world and love God at the same time. It doesn't work. And so there's a problem with how some of these people were responding to the fact that they were living in sin or that they were dealing with sin. And that was that they thought to themselves, you know what, sin just doesn't really matter. Maybe they didn't think that. Maybe that's just how they live. But regardless, what they were saying to God and to everyone else is, you know what, this sin thing doesn't matter anyway. I love God. I'm, I'm a Christian. I'm proud to be God. But the way that they lived their lives certainly didn't match up. That is, they'd go to church on Sunday morning, and then what they were doing on Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, Monday morning, Tuesday morning, Wednesday morning, everything until they got back, basically, everything was not godly. It wasn't right. It wasn't God-like things. Those two things just don't add up. It doesn't make a good Christian. All those bad things don't just get erased when you walk in the doors here. It just doesn't work like that. That's what John says. You have to realize that the wrong way to respond to the sin problem is to just act like sin doesn't really matter. The second wrong way is this. When you read on in the text and you look at verse 8 and you look at verse number 10, then you have these people that think, well, I don't even have a sin problem. I mean, I, I don't even struggle with sin. I'm not even worried about it because it's not even a problem for me. I don't even sin. I, I don't even have to worry about the devil. That's another wrong way to respond to the problem. It's just to think I'm not the problem. Everybody else is the problem. Everybody else has sin. Everybody else struggles, but not me. I'm good. I'm right. I'm fine. The tendency sometimes to think that we're beyond, you know, the need for grace, it, it, it happens, I guess, maybe happens to the best of us, that it's so much easier to point out everybody else's struggles and everybody else's sins that sometimes we lose sight of the fact that we too can do it and maybe that we are living in it. Sometimes it's easy to see others and it's not so easy to see our own. Jesus talks a lot about that, people who had a tendency to point that out in other people. And he constantly reminds us through the New Testament, pay attention to yourself, take heed to yourself, pay attention to what you're doing and what you're saying because you too can easily be in the same trap that these people are in. How can you respond wrong to the sin problem? Think it doesn't matter. Think you don't have a problem. But then, John, how do we respond in the right way? I and mean, what's the right response to the problem? Listen to the verses we didn't read. Verse 7. If we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Chapter 2 and verse 1. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you don't sin. This is why I'm telling you these things, so that you'll pledge your allegiance to Jesus and live in the light and not dabble between both, right? This is why I'm writing to you, verse 1. But if anyone does sin... We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He himself is the atoning sacrifice. Some of your Bibles might say he is the propitiation for our sins, not only for ours, but also for those of the whole world. The way that John kicks off this powerful letter is essentially drilling in the minds of these Christians two ideas. Number one, your faith, you can be confident you can rest assured in what you believe because it's as real as Jesus Christ 
who stood and lived and taught in the flesh. You can believe it with all your heart because it's as real as Jesus Christ. Number two, the thing that he drills in their mind is, it's not enough to just believe in Jesus Christ, but you have to reach a point in your faith where you believe Jesus Christ is the only solution to your problem. That acting like it isn't a problem, that's not a good way to live. That thinking you'll never have a problem, that's not a good way to live. But acknowledging that Jesus Christ has the power to deal with any and every sin that we bring and lay at his feet, that is a liberating thing. That allows us to move forward in the book of 1 John and handle the delicate issues about the life and responsibility that we have as Christians. And it changes the way that we view those commands and the way that we view those guidelines when we realize the blessing of what we have in the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. And so as we transition then into our thoughts for the Lord's Supper, and Joey comes and he leads us in a song, I want us to think about that. I want us to think about our lives And I want us to think about the commitment that we made to Jesus, the commitment that we've said, you know what, I want to be a Christian. Do we mean it? Do we mean is it real to us? Because the commitment that Jesus made to us, he meant it. And it was real. I believe. In the one they call Jesus, I believe he stood gallantly. I believe that he walked on the water, and I believe that he's the answer for me. Yes, I believe in the one they call Jesus. I believe he died on Mount Calvary. And I believe that the tomb was found empty. And I believe that he's the answer for me. I believe in the words of the Bible, how he made the poor blind man to see. And I believe that the deaf ears were open. And I believe he's made a difference in me. Yes, I believe in the one they call Jesus. I believe he died on Mount Calvary. And time, then he's the answer for me. I believe that he spoke to dead Lazarus, and he said, Unbind and set free. I believe that he reigns up in heaven, and I believe that he is coming again. Yes, I believe in the one they call Jesus. I believe he died on Mount Calvary. And I believe that the tomb 
young wife's fantasy. And I believe that he's the answer for me. First John 4 and verse number 10, John reminded them really about halfway through the book. He says, love consists in this, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. It's like John was reminding them of the purpose, why they do what they do, what fuels them to respond to God the way that they did. And it was all on the basis of the way that God responded to them, that he was moved with compassion to love us and not leave us in our sins, but give us an opportunity to do this very thing, to remember and reflect the goodness of that sacrifice, and what it means for us in our future. Let's pray together. Most Holy Father in heaven, we're thankful for this opportunity to be here together in this place with our family here at Chisholm Hills. And Father, we're thankful for this opportunity that we have to share for a few moments with you and to remember and reflect on the goodness and the mercy that you poured out of your heart for us in the person of Jesus Christ, that you were moved with compassion to see our need and to realize that there was nothing that we could do to solve it or to fix it, but that you had a perfect solution even before we were ever even a thought, Father, that you knew that your son was the spotless lamb that would stand in our stead and take on himself the punishment and the wrath that we rightfully deserve. And Father, as we remember the agony and the pain that his body endured, not just through the physical stripes and the beatings, but Father, even all the words that hurt Jesus and all the wear and tear that his body took to go from one end of the earth to the other to exclaim to all nations the love that you have for us. And in this moment, Father, we remember that we are grateful for it. We're convicted by it. We praise you and we thank you for the death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Let's continue our prayer. Father, we're mindful of the necessity of blood for our lives. How it fuels us, it gives us the things that we need to live. And Father, we know that it's not possible for us to live without it. As we think about our spiritual lives and the implications of that, that Father, it's just not possible for us to experience life without the blood of Jesus Christ, that we know that it is what gives us access to you and that it forgives us and it washes us clean and presents us to you righteous and holy. And Father, we're thankful for that. We're thankful for the power that it has to reach even the deepest and the darkest parts of our heart. Father, that there is no sin, no struggle, no problem too great for the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. And as we think of that, as we partake of this particular emblem, we think about what it represents to us, what it means to us, the future that we have because of it, Father, that in our hearts we'll 
conjure up a great gratitude and a great appreciation for the extent that Jesus went to bring us to you. In his name we At this time, we uh, usually end our lesson or our sermons or time and study together with an invitation for the purpose of, uh, well, I guess a couple of things. It accomplishes a couple of things, that if there is someone who recognizes the depth of their sins and the solution that Jesus offers, it's an opportunity for them to make that known if they would like and for us to aid in that process. Or maybe it's just something that you're struggling with and you realize you have your church family around you, then then that's a great opportunity to take advantage of that. And this morning, we didn't want to leave without that opportunity, but I, I wanted to remind you uh, of something that John reminds the people that he's writing to. And it's interesting the way that he begins is, this is what I'm telling you about Jesus. I want you to believe that it's real. I want you to know that it's real. And as he begins the last chapter of this book in 1 John, 1 John 5, beginning in verse 1, this is what he says. Everyone who believes that Jesus Christ has been born of God and everyone who loves the Father also loves the one born of him. This is how we know we love God's children, when we love and obey his commands. For this is what love for God is, to keep his commandments. And his commandments are to burden because everyone who has been born of God conquers the world. This is the victory that has conquered the world, our faith. Who is the one, verse 5, that conquers the world? But the one who believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. This can be your reality this morning. You can be one of those people that conquers the world if you are willing to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he is real to you, that it's not something fake, it's not something just passing time, but that he means the world to you and that you're willing to let the life and ministry that he lived change the way that you live. If you're not a Christian, you need to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ this morning. You can do that. It will change. It should change the way that you live. Maybe you are a Christian. You've been struggling with light and darkness. The good news is, is that the blood of Jesus Christ is powerful enough to dispel all darkness. That can be your reality this morning. Whatever your need is, we invite you to come to this Jesus while we stand and we sing.